Sound is an important feature of life. We dedicate one of our five senses to it. However, the perception of noise, which is a loud and unpleasant sound, will disturb and stress us, thereby lessening our quality of life. Let's look at how sound and noise can affect our health and well-being differently. Many people don't realize that noise pollution has an important impact on their health. Unless noise levels are very high, the effect that noise has on us is not so obvious. It is heard as sound or felt as vibration, but cannot be seen. This is compared to seeing or smelling dust or smoke, which is particulate air pollution. Fine particulate matter, also known as PM2.5, as fine means less than 2.5 micrometers in size, small enough to reach our lower airways, is known as the number one environmental cause of disease. The World Health Organization indicates that noise, as you can see here, is the number two environmental cause of disease by contributing 8% to the total estimated burden of disease from the environment. This is compared to other environmental stresses or pollutants, such as secondhand smoke, radon, dioxins, and lead of lower impact. The public health impact of noise may be underestimated as it is more challenging to assess than other stresses. Unlike air pollution or secondhand smoke, noise's impact on health in large part depends on how we perceive it and how it affects our psychological state. This impact also depends on if we are exposed during the day when active or during the night when resting. Another important feature of noise is that it can travel through physical barriers like floors or walls and can come from sources outside of the home which are difficult to control. For example, the noise from fireworks, rock concerts and jet engines. These uncertainty factors contribute to the lack of a clear linear dose response relationship for health effects, unlike air pollution. Therefore, it is difficult to accurately measure the full impact of noise pollution on public health, placing noise in the middle of this impact versus certainty plot. Noise can affect our health and well-being in many ways and on many levels. This pyramid illustrates that the most widespread impact of noise is through feelings of discomfort, being annoyed or disturbed. This exposure may easily lead to the next step, which is less widespread, however more impactful to an individual, a stress response in our body, indicated by changes in our nervous system and levels of stress hormones. This in turn may lead to risk factors such as increased blood pressure, clotting, glucose and cholesterol levels that may eventually result in severe cardiovascular diseases such as heart attacks and strokes, leading to mortality illustrated at the top of the pyramid. Besides these direct pathways to disease development, long-term disturbance to sleep by noise can cause chronic disease by altering lifestyle factors including how much exercise we perform, how much food we eat and how much we indulge in unhealthy habits such as drinking or smoking. Sound is measured by, um, as a pressure level using the unit decibel because sound is a change in pressure that travels as a wave across the air into our ear. Sound can also be measured as a frequency. Think about pitch. High frequency is high pitch and vice versa. Depending on the noise source, the frequency would be higher or lower. Now humans have evolved to be able to perceive noise from sources or sound at certain frequencies that are useful to survival. On one hand, we will experience pain if the sound level at any frequency is too high or loud. This happens at about 140 decibels, which is like being front row at a fireworks display or a rock concert. On the other hand, sounds of different sources or frequencies at the same level, for example, around a comfortable 60 decibels, can be perceived differently. Look here at the sound pressure level measured besides a rushing mountain river compared to rush hour traffic. The same sound level, however, one is considered noise and the other is quiet. To learn more about the health, economic, political and social implications of noise, let's chat to Assistant Professor Maria Forrester, an experienced noise researcher from the Barcelona Institute for Global Health. Maria, could you please set the scene for us as to who are the stakeholders and what are some of the regulations for noise within Europe? So basically, the European Union does not have legal limits for noise, environmental noise, so that's important. Uh, there are no recommendations, so uh, it's recommended to not uh, exceed 55 dBA during the 24 hours. This is an average for the entire uh, year. 
And then what uh, European Union requires governments is to carry out environmental noise maps for agglomerations of more than 100,000 inhabitants. And this has to be done every five years and also for major roads, railways and airports. So then um, member states have to take these uh, maps and carry out action plans for those areas where there are exceedances. And this has to be also uh, reported to the European Union. From a political perspective, noise seems to be less popular issue for public health and therefore less regulated than air pollution. Why do you think that this is? Yeah, well, this is actually true. It's concerning and there may be different causes. Uh, first of all, I think that uh, noise is still perceived as an individual environmental uh, annoyance and that this is just an acute nuisance. And therefore, it's not perceived as a problem that goes beyond the individual and that affects public health. But actually, low environmental noise levels, even if we don't notice them, even if we are not annoyed, uh, they create uh, health effects and chronic health effects. So even if we don't wake up at night, we can observe that there are reactions that can on the long term uh, affect health. A natural intervention study done by Hoogie and Associates almost 20 years ago showed an effect of airport noise on long-term memory task performance with a recovery following airport closure. Of the few studies on noise reduction due to COVID-19, what is your opinion as to which reductions might be possible to maintain long-term to help mitigate the health impact of noise exposure? Yeah, actually the lockdowns have, um, have shown that it is possible to reduce noise levels, environmental noise levels, in some cases um, to the recommended noise levels, in other situations not. And uh, this means that, so this, these reductions were due basically to the reduction in traffic. This is the main source of noise in, uh, in urban areas, but also outside urban areas. And in order to maintain them, I think uh, it, it is possible because this reducing traffic, which would be the most efficient uh, intervention, uh, is something that we also have to do for air pollution. And in this case, um, so there's also, there's also the need that individuals to realize that they can change their behaviors and also reduce the, the, the noise that we create ourselves. So uh, also during leisure at home, but then basically shifting from private transportation to uh, using public transportation and active transportation. And then there's a role of uh, city design. So it's important to preserve quiet areas and to have access to, to quiet areas also at home. You are a scientific advisor for the recent World Health Organization Environmental Noise Guidelines. Can you tell us a bit more about that experience? What did you find the most challenging? Yeah, um, the most challenging was actually to summarize all the available evidence on the effects of uh, environmental noise on health. That was an enormous task and it was uh, difficult to, to quantify how much it would take. And um, it was actually also challenging to, it was longer, a longer process also because we had to follow the very strict WHO uh, quality criteria. That's good, of course, but it, it was a, a huge task. And how about the most rewarding for you? So the most rewarding was certainly to contribute to translate this scientific evidence into practice. So to contribute to creating this guideline document that should serve policymakers to, to know the harmful health effects of noise on health and act to improve the situation. In the European Union, the amount of disability caused by environmental noise exposure has been calculated by epidemiologists. The units of this calculation, which is commonly used for other exposures such as air pollution, is a Disability Adjusted Life Year, or DALI for short. This unit is equivalent to one healthy life year lost per year due to disability affecting quality of life without leading to death. In this chart from 2014, you can see that nearly one million DALIs were attributed to noise-induced sleep disturbance alone, with hundreds of thousands attributed to noise annoyance, followed by tens of thousands separately for ischemic heart disease, cognitive impairment in children, and tinnitus. Tinnitus is damaged hearing from very high loud noise levels. Traffic is a major source of noise in cities, including cars, trains, and planes. Different transport types produce noise pollution differently. 
This graph shows how there is a difference in how annoyed we get by noise coming from different types of transport, despite similar recorded decibels, or dB, increasing from left to right. Planes are shown to be most annoying at equivalent noise levels to trains or cars. The difference comes from how intermittent the noise source is and how loud the noise is above the background noise. Planes pass at, at less frequency, yet can be noisier than background noise levels. So it is important to consider not only decibels, but also how we perceive noise events amongst background noise, which may become accustomed to. Let's take a look at the phenomenon of noise disturbed sleep, as we know to have a serious impact on the disability adjusted life years of a population. A sleep laboratory based study observed the stages of sleep overnight among individual volunteers. One night spent in this laboratory was without noise disturbance. Another night was with noise disturbance as simulated overhead flights. This chart shows the stages of sleep from awake to deeper sleep, stage one to stage four, reached over an eight hour period. Only when overhead flights were not simulated from two to 6 a.m. looking left to right, which could be considered as outside of airport operating hours, did individuals enter a deeper state of sleep, that is stage four. Not getting a good night's sleep leads to poor concentration and low energy during the day, meaning less productive and less healthy behavior. Let's now look at more uh, clinical impacts of traffic noise during nighttime compared to daytime. On the left side, we see vascular stiffness, an indication of blood vessel constriction following activation of stress pathways in the nervous system. On the right side, we see heightened blood pressure known as hypertension, which is another vascular response to stress. Both clinical indicators, if experienced long-term, are major risk factors for cardiovascular disease and death from heart attacks or stroke. In both the left and right graph, we see that vascular stiffness and hypertension, respectively, are more likely to happen with either a high number of noise events or high levels of sound pressure, and especially when exposure is during the night compared to the day. During the daytime, when we are awake, and even after a good night's sleep, noise can distract us from tasks at hand, for example, reading or writing. For students, this can be very harmful to their ability to learn and remember when performing tests. This graph shows the group together results of a study among 10 year olds at nearly 100 schools close to the busiest airports of the United Kingdom's Netherlands and Spain. Basically, we see that students reading ability known as reading Z score is reduced from top to bottom when tested at schools with higher compared to lower levels of aircraft noise. Importantly, the researchers doing this study saw a linear relationship or no threshold effect, that is no safe level, meaning that any reduction in noise level at school such as these should improve a child's opportunity to get a great education and the best start in life. It is especially encouraging that this effect on student learning has been shown as reversible thanks to a natural intervention study done in the past among schools either exposed or not to aircraft noise, but otherwise similar. This figure shows what happened when on one hand an airport closed and on another hand a new airport opened near schools. The chart shows an improvement of students' long-term memory task performance when the old airport closed compared to their peers in schools with no aircraft noise. The bar chart shows the opposite, a worsening of students' long-term memory task performance when the new airport opened compared to their peers in schools with no aircraft noise exposure. We now have a good idea how noise can affect us and how that effect can be addressed on an environmental or societal level. On a personal level, you may use headphones with your own soundtrack to block out environmental noise. However, be careful as if the headphones are not noise cancelling either actively by producing sound waves to neutralize background noise or passively by completely covering ears, they may be doing more harm than good. Groundbreaking research is assessing the risk of hearing loss or tinnitus in children and adolescents who from a very young age are using headphones with digital devices such as personal music players. They are being named the digital natives. We must do more to protect them and ourselves from noise by reducing unnecessary environmental noise and increasing access to quiet environments to learn and rest in peace.